that issue. Um, as I said, and uh, Chair, and I emphasize that the, the, this, is, this is not a crisis, that there has been a lot of good work that has happened in, in very difficult and challenging circumstances, uh, both a, a, a difficult legal framework as well as um, you know, a complex institutional context where a lot of work has gone, as I said, under the, the ABLE leadership, uh, under the guidance of Advocate Cronier to bring the ID to where it is. And so it is, it is often healthy that you have new leadership to, to take an, an organization forward from, from where it has been uh, brought to by, by the previous leaders. Um, so there has been engagement um, with Advocate Cronier pertaining to uh, her vacation of office um, before the end of the term. Um, and as I said, Advocate Cronier has indicated her decisions for this and, um, and, and, and we understand those decisions. Um, after a very, very challenging startup phase, um, we need to look forward. The, the, I, the NPA and the ID in particular is critical in terms of dealing with, with corruption. And as I said, Advocate Cronier leaves the ID well positioned, as she said before this very committee, I think it was two, two months or so ago, to really deliver important results in the, new, in the near uh, future. And so I'm confident that the groundwork that has been done really puts the ID, of course, the ID does not have all the resources. And you know, the Zondo Commission resources are being migrated and we're still trying to, to get it to a point where it will have everything that it needs. But whilst we are in this position, we need, it is, it is resourced, um, it is considerably in this time, and we certainly are poised to make some impact in just over 2.5 years, the ID is now a, a reasonably well-established unit within the NPA with over 120 staff, including four dedicated substantive units, two administrative and operation support divisions, a, a reasonably substantial budget, um, including a new uh, state-of-the-art building. And we, really to, we are ready to manage the transition um, from, from now until Edward Cronier leaves. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, there's also an important part. We are we are reaching the end of the Zondo Commission, and you know there's going to be a lot of work, as I said on Monday, an avalanche of work coming our way. And so we need to be ready uh, to ensure that the ID is is prepared to deal with those issues. And as I said, in uh, again, it's we are not going to be able to deal with everything that comes through from the Zondo Commission. We're going to have to really strategically prioritize cases for impact um, and sequence cases, because we are never going to have all of the resources to deal with, with all of the issues. I can give a little more detail on some of the, the, um, the resources of the ID, but just to say that, um, it, as I said, it's 120 staff members. We, we expected that this will grow to around 200 in 2022. The annual budget of the ID is approximately 107 million. And this is projected to grow um, to in, to, in 2022 uh, to, to about 180 million rand. Um, so we are, you know, the ID has begun the process of onboarding of the State Capture Commission resources in order to manage the process uh, of when the report is, is submitted to the president. Um, honorable Chair, honorable colleagues, in terms of moving forward, um, the, our priority as the NPA is to ensure that the ID in the short and in the longer term um, is, is ready and able to deliver uh, on its mandate. And this transition phase um, is going to be managed and led by Deputy National Director um, Advocate Rabaji Rasitaba, who will support um, Advocate Cronier and her senior managers uh, during this transition period. Um, the NPA will in parallel start the recruitment process to identify the new head of the ID um, in close consultation with the minister. Um, the process to appoint a new investigating director will be rigorous in order to ensure that the right person with the right skills is appointed who is able to deliver on this really difficult mandate um, of the ID. 
But what is clear, Chair, and I want to emphasize, is there will be no leadership gap. The, end, the ID is, as I said, it's, it's capacity, it's been capacitated a lot in this time, and there is, there's capable leadership in place that will continue to drive the work of the ID in the coming months. The staff in the ID, ID are committed. We have, we have staff that are dedicated to the ideals of the ID in bringing uh, you know, those responsible for corruption to justice, and that work will continue uh, pending the appointment of the new head. And as I said, Advocate Rabaji Rasatava uh, will work very closely during the final months in order to ensure that there's a smooth handover process um, with, as I said, the support and engagement of the senior leadership in the ID. Um, there's the following just a few points that I want to emphasize. Um, the NPA is not in a crisis. It's far from it. The NPA has been steadily building a very, very solid foundation. And I, I'm confident that we are, in fact, on a very, very solid foundation at this point. Um, Advocate Cronier's resignation and, and the Exco's decision to approve is a culmination of many, many factors. And I'm not going to discuss this in, in Parliament, um, but there has been uh, extensive reporting about the fact that there's been interpersonal relations that affected this. And as I said, in any very, very high stakes, high pressure environment, there's bound to be uh, tensions and, and professional conflicts. But we work through them. And Advocate Cronier and I both have the interests of the country at heart. And all the decisions we make are in the interests of the country. And the ID is, is under considerable pressure to perform. And it remains so. But we cannot respond to pressure. We are, we've got to act with a sense of urgency, which is what we're doing. But we cannot respond to pressure because that is when we make mistakes. And we cannot afford to make mistakes in the current climate. Um, as I said, the, the, um, the leadership transitions are normal and often healthy. Um, all organizations have staff turnover, and it's our job to ensure business continuity towards a very clear goal. And that is what we have. If we are not focused on this goal, and if we don't do whatever we need to ensure we are still moving towards that goal, then we are in a crisis. But that is not the case. At the Cronier was appointed the head of ID in May 2019, two years and eight months ago. As I said, it's a tough job, it's a tough environment, and it shouldn't come as a surprise that leaders will come and go. And Edward Cronier has decided to vacate at this point. And as I said, the ex-co of the NPA and myself have supported, have supported this. This is not a sign of any collapse or crisis in the NPA. Um, it's, as I said, it's healthy when leaders take an organization to a certain point and leave, and then leave it for a new leader with a fresh new energy to pick up from where um, we are, um, picking up on all of the good work that has been done. Um, it takes a long time to, to establish a new entity within any organization, especially within government. Most business and organizational design experts will agree that it would take at least three years for a new organization and department to even start breaking even. Structures, staffing, new policies, processes need to be developed. In the case of the, the ID, a lot of work has gone into this. The Government Technical Advisory Center, GTEC, an agency of National Treasury, which builds public sector capacity to improve governance and to enhance public service delivery has worked very closely with Advocate Cronier and the ID for just about two years. And it's therefore not surprising that considering all of the work that has been done and all of the work that still needs to be done, that the ID has gotten to this point in about two and a half years. The NPA has very good dedicated prosecutors and that is the strength of the NPA. In as much as we do need to build capacity in very specialized areas, and we are working on that, the, the drive and the, and the dedication of prosecutors is what will get us to achieving our goal. Chair, with regard to the second issue that we were called to report on, and that is the, the NPA um, missing the deadline with regard to, to the um, 
the so-called credit for matter. Okay, let me first, uh, before I deal with that specific issue, just sketch a very brief outline with regard to dealing with the TRC matters. Chair, we must recall that TRC matters for various reasons. And Advocate Vusi Piccoli has, has uh, deposed to an affidavit about the challenges that were faced in the NPA, has for various reasons not received the focus and attention that they needed, uh, that these cases needed. It is critically important for the, as the minister has indicated, for the, for the families of the victims, for the survivors to, to, to receive justice in these matters. And the reality is that up until now, our country as a whole has failed them in terms of bringing and holding accountable those responsible for atrocities that were committed during the apartheid era. And there are various reasons for this. So it was only in around 2017 that their investigations were on paper set to begin. But the reality is that we know that during that time, there was our institutions had been considerably weakened. The DPCI and the NPA were reeling from years of, of um, efforts to, to undermine and to weaken institutions. So there was no capacity to deal with these cases that require a dedicated focus. And so I took office in 2019, February, and there was there's as you I don't have to go into the context. I mean, it's it's well known what the position was when I took office. I had a meeting in 2020. I had various meetings with General Rabia, but we increasingly realized that dealing with TRC matters has to be a priority for law enforcement, for the National Prosecuting Authority. It was in 2020 that I had my first meeting, uh, a meeting with General Rabia and, and his team and, and members of my team um, to specifically deal with the issue of TRC matters. And we, we were very clear that we couldn't move on the TRC matters without a dedicated investigative capacity. The NPA does not investigate. And at that time, the TRC cases were still being managed from the national office in the PCLU, the Priority Crimes Litigation Unit, that was seized not only with TRC matters, but was also dealing with terrorism matters and a whole lot of other priority crimes. And there was, there was I would think there were a, a very, there's this very small capacity in the NPA to deal with a whole range of, of priority crimes, including TRC matters. And so we, we really um, implored General Libya, who committed to us that he was going to uh, recruit Special, special, he was going to recruit investigators that would be dedicated to dealing with TRC matters. And likewise, we committed to, to recruiting prosecutors and getting prosecutors, dedicated prosecutors, to deal with these cases. And so the process of recruitment has not been easy, even in the DPCI. It's taken a while. And so we have, in the meantime, we were, we were trying to deal with the TRC cases, but really without the capacity to deal with it. And it is earlier this year, um, with Advocate Rodney de Kock also having come on board, that we, we've, we've been engaging regularly with the families, with the lawyers representing victims, and we realize that it's important for us to have this engagement. We've also, as the NPA, we realize how important it is for, for the victims and families to be kept informed of what we are doing. And in various parts of the country, the DPPs are doing that. And in fact, we have, we have uh, there's a letter, a couple of letters that we've received um, that were in a particular case, I recall, the victims of TRC case actually commended and thanked the NPA for having, for addressing these matters and keeping them in form. I know that's just one example, but it's only to give, to give the assurance that this is a really, really important issue for, for the NPA. And so about, um, it was earlier this year that we decided, um, and we, we did have conversations with the lawyers uh, representing the families, that we were going to create a dedicated capacity within the NPS, that's the National Prosecution Service, under the direct supervision of Advocate de Kock, the Deputy National Director. And what we have done in this time 
Um, and, and together with that, um, General Libya has recruited dedicated investigators, and they are now deployed in various parts of the country, together with these prosecutors that have been recruited. And I have some, some uh, figures um, in that regard. Um, just want to get my figures right. Be beside, well, there are 17 dedicated investigated employed by the DPCI. Um, and in the NPA, um, we have filled the following posts. Uh, and when I say these are dedicated TRC prosecutors, chair and honorable members, I mean, these prosecutors are going to be doing nothing else but TRC matters. And that is very, very, uh, it's not the way uh, the NPA has worked. So this is very, very important. Um, in in KwaZulu-Natal, um, there are five posts that have been advertised, Western Cape 2, in Gramstown 4, uh, Northwest 1, North Kauteng 3, the NPS Head Office 4, Limpopo 1, Northern Cape 1, Free State 1, Mutata 1. And, and, the, and we have actually uh, considered the number of posts depending on the number of cases in a particular region. And so that's based on that um, figure. Uh, with regard to the TRC matters that we are currently attending to, in the Eastern Cape, it's seven, Free State two, Johannesburg eight, KZN 17, Limpopo two, Mtata two, Northwest four, North, uh, Northern Cape one, Pretoria eight, Western Cape six. And um, the other is just general, is 13, probably managed at the national so, office at the COP. So, so, sorry, NTPP. On that if it's necessary. So, so the total of 105 cases. Sorry, NTPP. Is, uh, a number, there are noteworthy cases NTPP. that are in court. There aren't many. NTPP, sorry. I agree. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry Chair. Yes. There's something that I would just like to get a clarity. I think it's a little bit confusing. The minister talked about 34 investigators and 23 prosecutors. Now, this 17 um, uh, that you are talking about and the 23 the minister is talking about, uh, can you explain it? Yes, Chair, we'll, we'll address that. Okay. Sorry, are we? Okay, thank you. Sorry about that, Chair. Uh, we'll address that issue, uh, Chair. And so there have been uh, matters uh, that have come to court. I agree it's been a trickle. But what I can assure the, the um, chair, honorable chair and committee members is that this capacity has been put in place. And we need to give it some time to really start working um, to, to see these cases coming through. We are working with an investigator um, that the families have appointed. And it is this close collaboration with the families that will allow us to, to move these cases forward. Now, the specific issue relating to the um, CRADOC 4 matter, where the, the NPA uh, missed a deadline, Chair. Chair, um, the position in that matter is that the, the, in an effort to get the, the NPA to move faster, the, the, the family brought an application to compel the NPA to make a decision. Um, what happened then is, and I will ask my colleagues to, to add to this, is that the matter was in court and we had to, um, the NPA made a decision, um, made, a, made a commitment to make a decision by the 2nd of Dece December, Namvula, is that right? But the second of de December, but it was it was it was dependent on investigations being complete. But yes, there was a commitment. Um, the the prosecutors handed the docket over to the um, lawyers representing the families, and they then identified a whole lot of issues that required further investigations, and it became clear that we were not going to, the NPA was not going to be able to, to meet the deadline that they had in fact committed to. And, and what the, the prosecutors then did is that they, um, the, the, the um, DPP of the Eastern Cape, uh, Mr. Barry Madolo, who is now himself personally involved in these matters. Um, on the 1st of 
uh, where do I have a date? On the, uh, on the 1st of December, sent a letter to um, indicate that, the, that we were not going to be able to meet this deadline. Um, and that, yeah, I just want to get make sure I get my facts right on this chair. Um, just one moment, let me get the... Um, indicated that we were not going to meet the deadline and attempted to inform the, the, the lawyers. But regrettably, it seems like that letter did not reach the lawyers. And, and that, was, that was the challenge in this matter. But it was clear from what the victims, or the family of the, of the victims had indicated, there's still a lot of investigation that's outstanding in this matter. And we need to be able to, together with the support and the investigator that the family has has brought on board to work together. In fact, I understand that just today or yesterday, I'm not sure, um, that uh, Mr. Madolo, the DPP in Eastern Cape, was meeting the investigator of the family in order to see how we could move this, this case forward. But what is clear is that there's still investigations. And I agree, one can ask the question, why did the NPA not deal with these investigations before the state? And, as I explained, this is what the challenges we were facing with. We have a dedicated capacity now. And I'm asking that let's just give this a little time to show results. And if at the end of a reasonable period, we say, look, this is also not working, then let's think about trying to do something else. So for now, Chair, um, that is the position with, with regard to, to the particularly the Ford Collata matter. And Chair, in as much as I understand the, 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 the frustrations of the family and the need to ensure that you know, these cases are brought to court quickly, we, are, we, are, we need to work with the families. It's difficult to litigate and to work together at the same time, but we want to work. We understand why they were perhaps driven to litigation, but we have to work together. In the case, for example, the COSAS 4 case has been brought to court uh, people have been charged there, and it shows that where the evidence is there, cases are being brought to court. So um, I just ask, Chair, that we, we be allowed to, to move forward with this new dedicated capacity together with investigators from the DPCI um, and try to get these, these cases to court as soon as we can. Chair, in conclusion, I'd like to say that, you know, as I said at the outset, Chair, the NPA is a critical constitutional institution in our democracy. And fixing the NPA, which is our goal, and, and also the criminal justice system, because there are serious challenges in the criminal justice system. Fixing the NPA and the, NP and, and the CJS is critical to the future of our constitutional democracy. The future of our country does depend on this. But what we are doing is that we are rebuilding systematically. It's like building a house chair. We have to have a strong foundation and we are really building it block by block. And these things don't happen fast, but there has been incredible progress given where we started two years and nine months ago. Think about it, chair, honorable chair, honorable, chair, honorable colleagues. Three years ago, we had suspects, for example, the Guptas that were still in this country flashing their wealth with ill-gotten gains of our people and various other people. But now, where are they? Hiding somewhere, trying to avoid arrest. And so, you know, we had not just them. There have been many people that have been fla flaunting their wealth, wealth, funded by money destined to uplift the poor and the most vulnerable. But today, the question is, are they sleeping peacefully in their ill-gotten luxury? Or are they wondering, when is there going to be a knock on their doors? That is the impact of our ongoing work. I know we need to bring cases, but Chair, there's a lot that's going on that's different from where we started. When I worked at the ICC, Chair, we worked under a very, very difficult, similar political context where you have a very challenging political environment, but you need to do your work as the prosecuting authority. So it's not only something that is peculiar to South Africa. And we need to make sure that we don't fall under the trap where we succumb to pressure. And because of pressure, we move too quickly when we shouldn't have. Moving too fast can be counterproductive. And we will play right. Can you imagine if just after the national director took office, we started prosecuting people that were accused of state capture without properly investigated cases? 
I, as the national director and the NPA, would have been accused of targeting certain factions. And therefore, we need, and we are still being accused of that. But what we are doing is systematically building cases. Chair, there's mountains or terabytes of evidence that prosecutors and investigators have to wade through in order to make sure that our cases are watertight. Failure chair of the NPA will be, a, indeed, it could be a, a huge, have a huge impact on our constitutional democracy. And it's like this house, you know, if, if you don't build a house on a solid foundation, it collapses and everybody is, it, people are injured or die. We can't afford not to build the NPA on a solid foundation. Our decision-making must be separated from pressure, but we must act with a sense of urgency. And that is what we are trying to do. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, NTPP. You said you are going to explain the issue of the 17 dedicated prosecutors, uh, investigators, and the 34 that was raised by the minister. Chair, I'm just, I'm just sorry, we have two. I'm just going to make sure. We, Chair, I'm going to get the detail from Advocate de Kock and the numbers and to see where's the confusion. And I'll respond to that as soon as possible, Chair. Thank you very much. And members, I have Honorable Chanchi. Uh, any other hands? Honorable Horn, Honorable Breitenbach, uh, Honorable Swart, Honorable Breitenbach. You start with Honorable Chanchi. And myself, Chair. Honorable Mola. No, I will, uh, members who raise their hands now, uh, you, you, you will be noted. Uh, let's allow Honorable Janji to proceed. Uh, thank you very much uh, to yourself for leading us to convene this uh, critical session. Let me also take this opportunity to thank uh, the NGPP advocate Matoy for the presentation she has uh, put forward. I, having watched her on Monday, making the, the media pronouncement, uh, I had mixed feelings whether the, the, the Monday media was a preemptive strike uh, before Wednesday. So by the time we come on Wednesday, she would have well prepared us. I was not sure whether that, that was the strategy, uh, but she seems to say it was long planned before Friday when we decided we want to see her. So I take that. But Chair, I just want to raise um, a, a, a couple of issues uh, in both of the two issues that we we asking the NDPP. And I want to do so, Chair, um, with the theme that I really want to drive home, that we are going to need to go beyond personalities. Institutions must hold beyond individuals. The NDPP must know that today, tomorrow, and forever that she's, she's, she's leading that institution because that certainly is going to be our attitude as the, as the Portfolio Committee and Oversight Board. We, we, whether there's Batoy today or Cronje or no Cronje, we are interested in the service of the NPA in terms of its core mandate. I really want to say that up front, because if we don't do that, we are going to be diverted uh, every time that this individual leaves, and, and then we are diverted from the core functioning of this institution. Advocate Batoy makes a firm assertion that there is no crisis in the NPA. She did that on Monday. She's repeating it today. I, I will accept the assertion that she's making. But uh, I think that uh, institutions, healthy institutions, uh, are characterized uh, by stability and leadership. Um, they are characterized by capacity and, and, and the kind of needed skills, but as well as operational efficiency in its core mandate. Just on those three issues, accepting that there's no crisis, on these three issues, I know that the NPA is found wanting 
on issue of leadership stability, on the capacity and the kind of needed skills and operational efficiency. And if you listen to this presentation, you are going to pick up some of those uh, uh, kind of issues. And I, I make a firm view that those three critical areas don't seem to apply to the NPA. Because as we know it, the NPA chair has got a lot of acting positions in provinces and regions. On Monday, one of the things that NDPP said was that the work is done in provinces. Uh, it's not necessarily done at head office. And yet we know that in many of those provinces, you've got a uh, lot of vacancies and acting position. We know for a fact that since Advocate de Kock left the Western Cape, that position has not been filled. It's been acting. And you can go to the free state. You can go to another province where you have this. That speaks to your issue of leadership uh, uh, capacity. I'll come back on the issue of the ID because just on, on her presentation on, 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 on this issue of the TRC, it begins to demonstrate to me that if she does not have a crisis, the NPA has got a problem and we must confront that problem. It's not new to us. We've been traveling this journey with them. Maybe when you are, the media is being addressed, that can be said, but not with us because we've been every step of the way from the first point when she was appointed as NDPP uh, and we going through that with her. As we sit here, the team, the leadership, many senior prosecutors and, and, and Honorable Breitenbach, Breitenbach normally raises this a lot. You see that got these salary disputes that we have between NPA and senior NPA prosecutors, some of whom have to continue um, being embarrassed about the people who are subordinate to them any more than what they could, to a gap of even over 21,000 uh, uh, in, in, in one of those examples. You've got low morale in the NPA, and I thought that she would attend to these kind of issues. Now, Chair, just on the ID, because my issue here, if Advocate Cronier has taken a decision, and I hope she's here, Chair, because Advocate Cronier remains the staff of the NPA. I hope uh, she will be able to speak to us, uh, because I would have certain questions directed to her. I hope she is here, because she has resigned to leave at the end of March. And, and, and uh, there are certain answers we'd want to, to hear from her, not for her to be spoken over by, 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 by the NDPP. There are three areas that uh, the ID had to focus on, and uh, I'm interested, Chair, as she's leaving, by end of March, in these three areas, do we have any time-bound assurances of deliverables in these three areas? One, she was tasked to deal with corruption in the security sector, okay? Two, to deal with corruption in the SOEs. Three, to deal with corruption that involves high level, both private and public individuals. Now, before we leave this meeting, my most takeaway, whether Advocate Tonya is there or not there, when the NDPP says they are poised to strike, can she confine that to these three areas and say to us, by March 2022, don't give me names, don't give me cases, not case numbers, but in each of these categories, is this committee, as we sit here today, being assured that on the corruption in the security sector, this is what is going to hand over, this is what we are going to be seeing, delivered. Um, without giving us the name, on the corruption in the SOEs, what is there that is working on to live with this institution, and the corruption on high level individuals, without giving us the names, because that would have been her core framework, a core area of work. And as she leaves, we cannot get clarity as to whether there's been progress on this, or is she leaving because there's lack of progress in terms of what she, she has been. So I would like to, to, to get that tip. 
and, 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 and I would leave that because I'm less interested in, because we did not call this meeting to say, we, we, because it's one thing to, to, to like an individual in terms of their performance, their, their ethical work and so on. But as I said, we're going beyond individuals we're dealing with institutions. On, on the issues of the TRC chair, it's very clear, just listening to Advocate Baitoy Sam, that it had, it had to take uh, attorneys and lawyers of a family to poke holes in the work of the NPA. That on its own, chair, is, is so profound to indicate that there is a problem of operational efficiency, of capacity, um, the fact that now that there needs to be further investigation because that would have been kind of identified. I think, Chair, on these issues of trade four, because on the other hand, you'd have the COSAS four and so on, who are in court and yet there's, there's that process is stalled. It's not just the trade four, but on this chair, I think we must make the point that what has been presented, Advocate Batoy, on this, from where I'm sitting in my watch, the, the justification you're making for this lack of progress is not persuade, persuasive, is not compelling. And, and I think this is, a, is the kind of presentation you're making that I, I, I think we should ask, ask you to go back and with some certain timelines share under your leadership to say by, by this time, end of December, or by this time in January, can the NDPP come back to us not with some kind of general presentation she has made. The NDPP or NPA has certainly been caught with pens down on this issue of TRCs. No amount of justification is convincing about this lack of progress. It's, a, it's actually a shame, Chair. So in conclusion, this is what I was, we don't have much in front of us to even say um, we, we are optimistic that something is happening, even as she concluded, she's not able to, to give us anything that we can take home. And I'm suggesting that we, before you close this meeting, we agree to say, this is a timeline you give it for, the, for them to, to come back with clear deliverables on this process um, in terms of the, the trade dog four. Thank you, Chairperson. sorry for being long. Thank you very much, Honorable Chanchi, Honorable Horn. Thank you, uh, Chairperson. Um, at the outset, um, Chair, I want to confirm that, yes, as in the past, we of course agree with the National Director that the NPA is an incredibly important institution for the health of our constitutional democracy. Um, and I think the context to today's engagement is, of course, Chair, the fact that when the NDPP took office, she came, uh, amongst other, to, to this committee with a very detailed and convincing analysis as to what was wrong at that stage at the National Prosecuting Authority, um, as well as a uh, undertaking and, and, and let's say, a, a, a plan as to how to rebuild. Um, but now we are some period, um, we have progressed somewhat um, in terms of time at least. And, and uh, at the outset, I want to, to, to say through you, Chair, to the NDPP, um, that is part of the context now. Um, and unfortunately, from where I'm sitting, Chair, one of the, 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 the problems we're having is that uh, um, apart from being informed that some sort of a foundation to this house has now been built, um, unfortunately, very little is 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 is, tan is, is displayed in, in by way of tangible and measurable evidence that that real progress has been made. So we've had the the engagement a few weeks ago around the 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 annual report um, when we uh, had the engagement with the ministry in the in the plenary some time ago we were informed that the annual report really is not 
showcasing what has happened since the end of the, the financial year. Um, but yet, we now see that the head of this investigative directorate, which was at the time, and others have mentioned it, uh, put forward in the public eye as part of the solution uh, of, uh, uh, to fix the, the inefficiencies that at the NPA and on the one hand, but also part of the solution um, in terms of the, the need to, to tackle corruption and state capture in this country. And therefore, when this, this head of the, the investigative director chair is leaving office before the end of, of, of her term, uh, South Africans, and we are now their representatives, are really entitled to, to transparency and accountability. So when I hear the, the, the NDPP say that she's not going to, to unpack the interpersonal issues that has been there, I, I can accept that, Chair, because I think she's quite correct to say that any one of us who's, who's worked in any uh, environment, whether it is a high-pressure environment, a corporate environment, or whatever environment, would, un would understand and accept that there's always going to be some interpersonal tension. But having said that, I think without going into detail, uh, one must ask the question as to, to what extent has that interpersonal issues contributed to the fact that Advocate Cronier is going to be leaving office prematurely and whether it can be stated without fear of contradiction now or going forward that ultimately those issues did not play any role. So that's the first question I want to ask. Then secondly, Chair, in terms of, of also now managing the situation, and if I am to accept that this is not a crisis, then it has, is at least a serious bump in the road. And in terms of managing an institution like this with, with, uh, with the responsibilities that comes with being the national director, my view would firmly be that whilst one cannot bow to public pressure, you still have the duty in, in a situation like this to, to do some serious introspection and to ask yourself, given the fact that you as the national director is the one functionary in this country who is supposed to have, supposed to have all the information as to what has led to this resignation, you must ask yourself, if this, if I can turn back the clock, what, what would I, should I have done differently? Or what would I have done differently if I, if I were in the same situation? And that is, of course, the type of question you must ask yourself in order to, to, to grow from this situation and as part of senior management. So I want to ask the NDPP, what is the answer to these questions? And that is not necessarily chair only in respect of the interpersonal issues, but also if one then accepts that the interpersonal issues was not at the heart of the, of the resignation, then, then there of course must be structural issues that has led uh, the, the head of the in investigative directorate uh, to, a, to reaching a, a conclusion that, that ultimately she must leave this office. Because, I mean, if, if we are to accept that this investigative director it has been positioned by her in such a way that it, it's ready to, as the Honorable Jainke said, pounce now, then there must be some other very serious structural issues that has caused this resignation. And I think we are entitled to ask what, what has uh, are those, even if it is not necessarily something which with which the NDPP agrees? But once again, um, even if you disagree with with the relevance or ultimately whether 
those issues should be a deal breaker. What are those and how are you going to respond so, so that in an objective manner, the successor won't also ultimately um, in a few months leave the office because of these structural issues. So we hear, Chair, about the 120 staff members and the, the, the hope, really, that this will be increased to 200. But if we look beyond the five-year scope of this, this, uh, this, uh, this investigative directorate, and we ought to assume that something, uh, even if it's not this investigative directorate, maybe a successor type of unit, is going to be there on a more permanent basis, what is the long-term vision as to, to the, 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 uh, the look and the feel and the organogram of this? And ultimately, uh, to what extent has the fact that, we, that, that, that this quite possibly has not been settled also influenced the decision of Advocate Kroon here to leave office? And then lastly, Chair, uh, three issues. Um, and I heard the, the NDPP uh, making the statement about inaccurate media reports, and, and whilst all of us in politics uh, quite obviously also have at some stages uh, been at the brunt of maybe inaccurate report, the, the reality is that the media play a vital role to, to assist in terms of also informing South Africans and, 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 uh, and playing an oversight role in terms of public institutions. So, so whilst I have some sympathy for her, I think the reality is that we can also not leave unattended to as to what has been reported. So two issues I want to raise in this regard is the first issue is that some of the media seem to suggest that, that some of the tension was not interpersonal, but rather centered about the lack of the results after an expenditure of about 400 million rand in respect of consultants or senior senior legal practitioners, which if I remember at the time was going to be the ones who ultimately through their, their involvement as consultants, trying to, to, to ensure that the NPA take watertight cases to, to, to court. So they were going to be the ones who question evidence, chains of evidence, um, so is there any, any truth that ultimately the 400 million rand has been spent, but, they, but the, the cases are not case ready yet? And then maybe linked to that, Chair, the whole issue of, um, and this is a repeated refrain when, when, we, when we talk about these uh, state capture and corruption related cases, and it has been again been said today by the DPP that it cannot be a thought that there be mistakes made. And, and then some of the media reports seem to suggest that ultimately the fear for failure was a, a major issue in respect of the way the, the investigative director has, has gone about their affairs or the preparing cases. So I want some comment regarding that. And specifically, ultimately, I want to ask Advocate Patoy the, the question as to, yes, whilst, of course, nobody wants to go to court with a something less than a, a rock-solid case, when do you reach that tipping point where you, you also realize that this case is ready, even though it may not be perfect, because even a non-perfect case might be winnable? And then lastly, Chair, in respect of the uh, the, the building of, of capacity, and today the statement again has been made that, and we accepted at the time that that capacity to deal with this type of more complex cases was lacking in the, in the NPA. Uh, and now it's being said that we are building this capacity, but I want to, to know how are we building this, this capacity if we're not taking cases to court? Um, I mean, it obviously can't be built through moot courts. Um, I would have always thought, and that was my understanding at the time, that through taking uh, less complex uh, cases uh, uh, to court, uh, the capacity in the prosecution, 
amongst prosecutors would be built to then ultimately start taking the less, the, the more complex cases to court. Um, so I want some feedback on that regard, uh, in this regard, also re uh, having heard the statement again that we are building this capacity within the ID um, in, in terms of more, more senior prosecutors needed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable uh, Horn, Honorable Swart. Well, thank you, Chair, and thank you to the NDPP. And I just want to start off by just also encouraging you and all the staff in the NPA, this is a very challenging time for you. And though we might ask some very robust questions, we do join you in wanting you to succeed, in wanting the successful prosecutorial services to be set up to build on that foundation that you have been doing and to bring to book all those criminals that are being involved in gender-based violence, in state corruption, and to recover the ill-gotten gains. And so I appreciate the work that you've been done, that your colleagues have been doing up to now, given the fact that the NPA was hollowed out largely under the previous administration, and it does take time. And I know the Deputy Minister hopefully is on the platform. I mentioned this in Parliament as well, that I do understand the complexities of these matters, of the forensics involved, but at the same time, I'm sure you'll appreciate that we, as public representatives, are also have been under pressure to ask the right questions and to inquire as to the successful prosecutions of those involved in state capture. Given the fact, in my, for example, I was personally involved in the parliamentary ESCOM inquiry some years back. And I remember even at that stage saying there is evidence already. And so it's a number of years that has passed, but understanding the complexities of this, these issues. So, so from our perspective, we clearly are deeply saddened by the resignation of Advocate Grenier. And I would like to thank her through this portfolio committee for the work that she's done in setting up the ID and under very difficult circumstances, under budgetary constraints. And I'm sure my colleagues will, and the chairperson might want to comment on this at a later stage, setting up this very, um, very important institution setting up that foundation. That having been said, I appreciate the fact that details have not been given as to Advocate Cronier's resignation and the reasons for that. But if one has a look at her last briefing, which was in July, one can glean from that some of the frustrations. And so I'd like you to just refer to this and so that we can have an understanding of whether these frustrations are being addressed and to what degree we as parliament can assist you, given the fact that this could have contributed to her resignation. Let me just highlight some of them and they relate to institutional impediments that she has set out at that stage. It was before parliament's standing committee on public accounts. First of all, the lack of skilled and capable investigators and prosecutors who are equal to the scale and scope of the investigations and prosecutions that the ID is seized with. Secondly, the dependence of the ID on personnel for secondments from law enforcement partners, because the NPA Act does not make provision for the appointment of investigators to the NPA on a permanent basis. Now that relates to security of tenure of, your, uh, of the investigators in the ID, and I think that is a great concern. And to what degree is that being addressed to ensure that your investigators have security of tenure? Thirdly, what was, uh, if this uh, account is correct, a dire skills shortage in the public sector with constraints on employing skills outside of the NPA, specifically recruitment of financial investigators and critical litigation skills at sustainable remuneration rates. The next item relates to plans to transition state capture commission resources and capability to the ID being delayed by the extension of the commission's timeframe 
with significant impact on the ID work. Now we appreciate in that regard that there has been the laboratory is being set up, the forensic laboratory, according to the minister's briefing in November, um, that the forensic lab currently being used by the Zonda Commission is going to be transferred to the ID. Can we get an idea as well as to how that is progressing? And of course, the transfer of the investigators that are presently working with the Zonda Commission to the ID or the NPA and what the tenure, what their tenure will be. Another item that was raised by Advocate Cronier has been the institutional impediment related to slow procurement processes within the state being a further delaying factor. And lastly, the digital and commercial investigation capability, which, she, which is a, purportedly said to be critical in cases where, as you've said earlier, uh, NDPP, terabytes of data has to be analyzed and processed. So those are some of the concerns that she raised, and it would appear that they could, if one speculates, this could have been a reason for reaching a level of frustration not and not being able to continue. So if you could comment on that, I would I'd greatly appreciate that. The next item that I'd like to raise is we understand the head of the asset forfeiture unit will now, the advocate Rabaji Resetabe Tebe, will be assisting or supporting advocate Cronier in this transitional phase. Now, we're all aware of the challenges that the asset forfeiture unit has. And if one has regard to uh, what is purportedly said, that Advocate Cronier has been working night and day on these issues, how will she manage? How will, how will the head of the asset forfeiture unit support Advocate Cronier in this transitional phase? And will this not negatively impact on the asset forfeiture unit itself? Now, one of the perennial issues has been the cooperation with the Hawks and the challenges with those dockets being prepared. Was this possibly a reason for Advocate Cronier's resignation as well? And how is that relationship at this stage with the NPA and ID being also reliant to a large degree on the capacities of the Hawks? Now, I was interested at the, um, to, to note again that the, the budget for the ID, 107 million to 180 million. And again, we as Parliament need to accept the fact that we appropriate funds. And when there's such budgetary constraints given to the ID, which would has been uh, said to be a mid-sized law firm taking on the massive billions of rands that are, have been stolen, can it be... Can it be fair to expect the ID to do the work required of them given these budgetary constraints? It's to me still, even though one could argue 180 million is a lot of money, it's still a very small amount given the complexities of the cases. When one looks at the ESCOM case, for example, could it be a possibility that ESCOM helps fund those prosecutional matters. I know there was challenges with the Steinoff investigation where the Steinoff company funded forensic investigations, but surely one needs to start looking at additional financial resources to prosecute these very large cases, obviously maintaining one's independence at all times. I know there was controversy even around the Stein of forensic uh, funding, but to make progress and to have the sufficient forensic, there's probably forensics where the most money is spent. And again, as, as, as Mr. Horn indicated, the 400 million for legal practitioners, sums of money need to be spent. But the benefit, as I've always said, is you can recover hundreds of billions of rands, the SIU can, the asset forfeiture makes no sense to me to cut your budgets when you can recover millions and millions of rands, unless there's not a political will to support the work you're doing. 
And at the end of the day, we as parliamentarians need to accept responsibility for that as well without, but at the same time, as Honorable Dianti said, to hold you accountable as well, very much so. When it comes to the TRC cases, I would just like to ask about the, the pending High Court case now. Given the fact that, if I understood correctly, an undertaken was given, uh, I'm not sure if that was made an order of court, given the family's litigation, and the fact that you have indicated there will be uh, feedback, but is that litigation now going to continue, given the fact that the deadline was not adhered to? Thank you, Chairperson, for the opportunity to ask these questions. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Ernest Breitenbach. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. <clears throat> Yes, uh, Chair, look, I understand perfectly the uh, size of the job that the National Director undertook uh, when she was appointed. I probably understand it better than most. Uh, I understand, again, probably better than most, how difficult these cases are to prosecute and how much time and effort goes into the investigation phase and compiling a docket that is court ready. It takes time. It takes serious amount of expertise and it takes a lot of work so you can accept that i have full uh, comprehension of those difficulties but we are three years down the line and we have seen very little progress uh, i'm sure that there's been a lot of progress in the back room uh, building uh, institutions, building uh, prosecutors, building dockets. Uh, but again, the, 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 that's what the public needs to see. And the National Director knew that when she took office. She knew that even then the public was impatient and angry and hungry for results. Uh, she acknowledged as much when she accepted office. And it's, 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 it's not frankly, good enough now to keep telling us we need to be patient. Um, our patience has run out. That runway is closed. South Africans need to see results. And this committee, fortunately or unfortunately, is tasked with oversight of these institutions, and we must ask, we're here to represent the public. We must ask those questions on their behalf, because if they were here, that's what they would be asking. We need to see results. We need to see people in court, we need to see prosecutions happening. We need to see people going to jail. It's as simple as that. It's not hard. And I know that the National Director understands that. How she gets there is unfortunately her job. And they must now do it. Uh, Mr. Chair, Advocate Cremier is, I'm, I'm largely covered with regards to these issues by uh, Advocate Yankee and Advocate Horn and uh, uh, Mr. Horn and uh, Mr. Swart. Oh, Jesus, just a second. Um, I'm sorry, can somebody ask in my place? Does someone ring my doorbell? I'll go next. Honorable Noma Tamba Jale. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, Chairperson. My uh, network is not well. I decided to switch off my my my, my camera. Uh, Chairperson, I have a few questions for Advocate Batui. I just want to start first with the issue of Advocate Cronier. Uh, <clears throat> on that one, Advocate uh, Batui, I just want to find out now that she is leaving the office and uh, really the committee is left with uh, my colleague has already alluded to that uh, left with so many unanswered questions uh, there's a lot that we're still expecting from her and now she's living with the very same knowledge uh, there was progress uh, that uh, she has been reporting about uh, to the committee and now 
somebody who's going to come will come, but even if you'll be able to take over, but I don't think that maybe uh, uh, to me, it, it will be like, you know, that progress, it will be like, uh, uh, we'll be able to gel as quick as we are expecting, if I may say. Uh, but the question that I have on this one is that uh, Advocate Cronier was a woman and she's leaving that position uh, where really it is a, 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 it is a setback when it comes to the emancipation and empowerment of women at the level of the senior, a, a senior position in this country. I just want to find out if, uh, have you considered that uh, when you replace her, you replace her with a woman? Uh, if not, why? Um, question, the second question is on the TRC. Uh, we just got the report that uh, the investigated work started from 2017 to show progress. Uh, up to this far, Chaperson, uh, is about five years, and uh, we are still where we are. We, we really understand the challenges and the complexity, the complexity when it comes to such matters. Uh, but, you know, with the families, as we indicated earlier, the public and the family, uh, to them, uh, it is really not justice. I heard you uh, advocate through your chairperson earlier when you were saying these things don't happen fast. My colleague, have, uh, they have commented on that one. That statement on its own really does not bring comfort uh, to the public and families because these issues of uh, TRC, they have been on the shelf for a long time. And really, uh, Talking about losing patience, uh, it's an understatement. Uh, this is one important issue to this country when it comes to uniting this country and bringing cohesion uh, to this country, to the people of this country. If we are going to take this matter, uh, the way I see it happened, it is really not going to help this country uh, to, <clears throat> to unite and to have the real rainbow country that we expect as the people on the ground. So five years is too much. And the report that we are getting now is that uh, within the years, only 57 families have been engaged on this matter. That is the report. When I calculated the numbers that you have gave us, you gave us uh, in terms of the provinces, uh, they, gave, they give us 57. And to me, Chairperson, the question comes into my mind is that is that the whole the, 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 all these years of apartheid, is it only 57 families? But I know it's not 57 families, but is that all that we can do for this country? And my issue also on this part of the families is that I was thinking in my mind that uh, these families that we are talking about, 57 of them, it might be the families of those people that they are maybe well known, you know, they were well known and they, they are the families that, uh, for example, the, 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 the two ones that we are just talking about, uh, that maybe they are people that are really behind the foundations that are trying to push that they get justice on these families. What about those families that do not anybody to assist them the organizations like Kuluma and all those organizations uh, they've been bringing families 
uh, forward to give their stories. Issues have not yet seen the light of the day. So I'm saying five years, that five wasted five years from 2017, including the years when we got democracy, is that all that we can do? This chairperson brings me to the issue of saying, maybe this committee can also assist the families and the public by bringing speed on these issues of the TRC. For example, we have a slot, as we have been reported that we are having investigator, investigators that has been dedicated to this work of the TRC, that uh, we, 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 we give slot, we should not cluster this matter with other issues, because it is very important, Chairperson, very important. We give it its own slot so that we can monitor its progress and be able to give closure, even if it's not closure that we, 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 we think that maybe uh, we'll finish it now, but we should see progress. Closure to some other families as we are sitting here as a committee, at least we count and say, this one we dealt with and uh, people are big. We hear about uh, the committee saying they want to see uh, politicians in orange overalls every day. We want to see also perpetrators of apartheid in orange overalls, old as they are because now we are not going to, we have been waiting for a long time. So we, if we can have a, a, a different slot, Shepherdson, and also if we can be uh, given a report about those other individuals and other families that they have not been consulted, one will appreciate. Uh, progress is what we need, Shepherdson. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Chele, Honorable Regenbach. Thank you, Honorable Chair. I apologize for the interruption. Um, so yes, I was largely covered by my Honourable Janky, or uh, Honourable Horn, and Honourable Swart. Um, but there are but there are issues that are not being addressed that are being glossed over by uh, generalities and platitudes, and and uh, that's disappointing. Um, Advocate Cronier is not uh, a faint-hearted woman, not by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, she knew what the job was when she signed up for it. She has a history of uh, employment in the NPA. She was a senior manager in the NPA for some time. Um, so she, she knew what she was, uh, was getting into. And I'm not convinced uh, by this um, the suggestion that um, everything is, is hunky-dory and there's there are no issues, and uh, her leaving is is nothing odd, and, and that in fact it's healthy to uh, change horses in midstream. Um, we know it isn't, uh, and I agree with Honourable Janke in that regard. So uh, we don't know why she's left. The, we we left to speculate along with uh, with everybody else who's speculating, and the national director is not telling us, <clears throat> but. Uh, it is deeply concerning that somebody of the caliber of Advocate Cronier abandons her, her project on which she has obviously worked very, very hard and put in a lot of time at great personal cost, uh, half complete. It's unlike her and uh, it leaves me deeply concerned. I don't expect to get any more information than has already been given. Um, I'm merely commenting that uh, I'm, I'm I'm not, in, I'm not convinced, and, uh, and while it may well be healthy to change, uh, a change in leadership may be healthy every now and then, it's, it's, uh, this was a, a fixed-term contract. It was only for five years. It was never going to be forever, and, uh, and it's very unlike Advocate Cronier to leave uh, a project dangling halfway through, so I'm concerned. Um, the national director in the press conference mentioned that um, that the in, in investigative directorate was only dealing with a, a small percentage of the of the matters, concentrating on the highest priority cases, the I presume the most complex. 
and highest profile cases and with the rest were being dealt with by the specialized commercial crime units. Um, I would like a, a percentage breakdown so that we can understand precisely what's happening here. What percentage of matters is being dealt with by the ID and what percentage of matters is being dealt with by the SCCU? And then how is the SCCU capacitated to deal with this massive influx of work? Uh, and when the Zondo Commission uh, work arrives at the NPA, I've got no doubt that the greatest bulk of that work will also devolve to the SCCU. And uh, what has been done proactively to ensure that they are capacitated to deal with the work? Because we all know that prosecutors are not uh, are born, they are made over a long period of time. So it takes anything between five and 10 years to make a decent prosecutor, an experienced, capable, confident, because that's very important, confident prosecutor. It takes around 20 to make a, an experienced, efficient, capable, and confident specialist prosecutor. It doesn't happen overnight. So what has been done proactively to, uh, to ensure that the SCCU will be uh, fully capacitated to deal with this this amount of work that is clearly not all going to go to the ID. And when the ID in five years' time ceases to exist, or in, 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 less than, in less than three years' time ceases to exist, what is going to happen to those cases then? Um, if the resignation of Advocate Cronier has taught us anything, it should be that we should be looking ahead. So what is the plan for the future? Um, then... The National Director uh, referred to the, in the press conference, particularly to Stalingrad test tactics being used by um, accused people in, in high profile cases. And of course, we all know that's true. Um, we've seen the, the master of it doing it for the last 20 years. Uh, so everybody knows about these Stalingrad tactics and every prosecutor certainly knows about them, but of course they must be dealt with. Cases can't drag on forever and ever in a day simply because the accused doesn't want to stand trial. So um, there are sections in the Criminal Procedure Act, more specifically Section 342A, that deals with this kind of thing. And there's a portion of Section 342A that has not been promulgated and it relates to cost orders. Is it in the view of the National Director, would it be helpful to, to dealing with these issues if that... Uh, if that section was promulgated, and if so, she must tell us so that we can try and assist. The National Director also had um, a semi-harsh approach towards the press. And I agree with her that the National Prosecuting Authority must be supported, and Lord knows we've certainly supported them. Um, uh, they've got to deserve and then earn that support, though. So uh, to, to suggest that the, the press shouldn't criticise uh, is a little unfair, I think, and, and not real. And, uh, and it needs to be a two-way street. If there's, a, if there's a proper interaction and communication with the press, um, then they wouldn't have to um, rely on, on uh, information that's not necessarily factually correct. But I do want to point out that prior to the appointment of this national director, so present company excluded, um, to a very large extent, the public was reliant on the investigative journalists to tell us what was going on. There was no one else. The National Prosecuting Authority was captured fully and up to all kinds of shenanigans. If it hadn't been for investigative uh, journalists, we would have been in serious trouble and state capture would never have come to the fore. So, um, there's a lot of very good work done by the press and they should be acknowledged for it. Uh, and then I'd like to get to the, the TRC matters. I'm not sure what the, the role of the PCLU is if it's not doing TRC matters. Um, I, uh, I may be wrong, but my, my initial understanding of the PCLU was that it was, amongst others, set up to deal with those matters. Um, and it is a long time. It's a, a lot of water has flown under this bridge. We are 
28 years down the line of a constitutional democracy and and still those families are are waiting for justice um it's a, it's a inordinately long time to wait for justice and we're not referring to to trivial matters here we i mean families have been very seriously impacted um and and many 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 people have been affected by these cases and i know that the national prosecuting authority knows that but the only thing that that they have left is is some sort of justice for their for their family members who were killed or disappeared and if they don't get that justice well then we certainly failed them the npa will have failed them and so would we uh and and we we can't afford to do that uh and so you know my, my disappointment with the with the lack of progress in the trc matters stretches to all of them but i would particularly like to refer to the matter that uh, that we um asked the national director to come here for today and that's the um credit for matter my understanding of the situation is is that the matter has dragged on and on and on despite um personal undertakings undertakings given to uh, particularly um mrs goniwe and mrs kalata and that those undertakings were not met and as a result of that uh, as an act of desperation the litigation was undertaken um rather reluctantly and that the, the litigation was then suspended because of the matter being placed under case management by um judge ledwaba and the, the litigation was suspended on the basis on the back of an undertaking that a decision would be given by the 2nd of december so when the uh, date approached the due date given an undertaking given to a judge no less um which in my day carried some weight i'm not sure if it still does that it should um in the in the run up to that date arriving and and being fully aware because certainly the, the prosecutor involved must have been fully aware that they weren't going to meet that deadline but surely proactively a, a week a day a month before you contact the parties and say we gave you this undertaking we've done our very best these are the circumstances preventing us from managing and can you possibly give us more time and certainly to include the judge in that correspondence so that he also knows I would have thought that that would have been the way to deal with it. Um as it happens the the letter sent by Mr. Madonna did not reach the intended recipient and so the day came and went with with nothing. Can you imagine the crushing disappointment? It's it's just not the way we should be treating um you know complainant citizens and particularly not in in matters of this sensitivity. So I really don't think that it's being dealt with very well and and i do think that um that more can and should be done in that regard i'll leave it there mr chair thank you thank you very much honorable pretenbach honorable nola eh uh, well well thank you very much sir eh uh, the the disadvantage about your committee chair is that if you are the sixth speaker on the line when your term your time comes all issues may have been exhausted uh, nevertheless uh, no I, honorable, I just... <laughs> no honorable man. there is no in fact uh, you won't be penalized when you say no i'm covered <laughs> You want to no, say I I I, <laughs> I just have some few uh, 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 sharp issues to to point out. Uh, although my colleagues have covered a lot of ground, uh, and uh, I agree with uh, all of them, starting from uh, Honorable Janke to Honorable Breitenbach. The first issue chair is the last point uh, Honorable Breitenbach uh, uh, finishes on. on on the failure of the prosecuting authority to inform the 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 families or the legal representatives 
Yes, one would have actually expected NPA to have written to them uh, a month, uh, two weeks, explaining why they would not be able to reach the, 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 the undertaken uh, deadline. But moreover than that, uh, the, the answer from the NDPP says they have attempted to write to the legal representatives of the family. But those legal representatives did not actually receive the letter. I mean, in my view, this is a very ambiguous answer. It's 2021. We are no longer using Telegram. We are swiftly going away even from the postal services of the South African post office. Nowadays, even when you send an email, chair, it tells you if this email was sent or not. It even tells you when the address you are sending the email to could not be found. So I think the NTPP should not be shy to tell us that the NPA failed to honor what they were supposed to have done. Because from where I'm standing, the explanation of the attempt to send the letter to legal representatives does not stand. Or if the NTPP can convince us that it stands by saying, this is what actually happened. Not the fact that we attempted to send a letter that they could not uh, they find it and all that. To me, it's, a, it's an ambiguous answer that does not help what we're trying to do as this committee. Two, Chair, given the current evidentiary material at the disposal of the NPA, both the financial and the human resource they have. What do they think will be the turnaround time for them to resume prosecution on these apartheid crimes? It's 27 years after democracy, and we're still talking about a backlog on non-prosecution of apartheid crimes. Crimes that have been declared to be crimes against humanity. It's not acceptable, Chair. And I want to propose, Chair, to you, to the committee as well, that this must be part of our focus areas as the committee. We must pay particular detail on this thing and ensure that there is periodic reporting on the progress made in the prosecution of these apartheid crimes. The last issue Chair, I would want to raise, NDPP, we have asked you nicely as this committee to pay focus and attend to a matter of a warfare between black prosecutors and the management of NPA in the Eastern Cape particularly. But as things stand, it looks like the problem is actually worse than it was when we first met and talked about it. It looks like there is no improvement between these black prosecutors and these managers of NPA. And the, the, the accusations leveled against these managers still stand. Now, I would want to check if there has been any progress made in terms of mitigating that program, pro, uh, problem. Because it is a problem, Chair, and it creates a very inconducive workplace condition when colleagues are taking each other to court over internal matters of the prosecuting authority. Has there been progress made in terms of mitigating the problem? Is there an internal effort the NPA is doing to ensure that it brings the problem to an end so that the work of prosecution on behalf of South Africans can resume without any turbulences. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Mola, Honorable Hendricks. 
Thank you very much, uh, Honourable Chair, Honourable Chair, Hon uh, Honourable Jelly. Touched the court for the nation. And this was later reinforced by the Honourable uh, Brayton Bach. The matter of uh, TRC cases is very close to the hearts of uh, many of us. But it was very encouraging to hear the uh, National Director uh, uh, suggesting that uh, families must work uh, closely with a dedicated uh, unit. And that's why I want to ask the question, is there cooperation with the legal teams of Imam Abdullah Harun and the legal team of Chief Albert uh, Latuli? Uh, as we know, the Chief Albert Latuli's uh, daughters are of advanced age, and Imam Harun's wife passed on losing much needed evidence. The Hawks opened, uh, uh, showed the family of, of the chief in our office in Stanger, uh, the files two years ago, and since then, nothing, nothing has, uh, has happened. We, with regard to the Craddock 4, we would like to know if there's a case number. And we would also like to know if there's a case number for the 1667 families referred to. At least that will give the families uh, some comfort. <laughs> no, uh, you know, uh, I, I know there are many, many other families as well. But, but, but should, shouldn't that be the case? It also looks that professional conflicts uh, are, are harming our democracy. Uh, so there's something wrong in our appointment uh, uh, processes. Uh, uh, Honorable uh, Chair, um, with regard to the email that disappeared into cyberspace, it's a clear indication of Stalingrad tactics, the very thing that the... Uh, uh, the national director uh, speaks against, and uh, uh, isn't there a a, 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 uh, a case that the uh, national director's department uh, must be charged with defeating the ends of justice and misleading the courts? Uh, 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 so, 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 so that is a, a question mark, and the nation uh, uh, wants uh, uh, answers. It is now five parliaments that have failed to carry out the directives of the TRC and the sixth parliament, you know, we just cannot fail. And that's why we depend on the national director uh, to up their game. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Hendricks. Uh, NTPP. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Maybe do you want uh, a three minutes? Chair, there's, a, there's a number of questions. We're going to try yeah. to cluster them and, and deal with them. Um, Maybe but we, if we I may, you, first we start with the... Um, we will give you three minutes. So the TRC that matters, and then I will ask um, Advocate Cock to go into some of the uh, more specific technical okay. questions that were asked. Um, and to yeah, I really want the, to, and I said this um, at the outset, I, I agree with all of the committee members who say that it's unacceptable where we are with the TRC matters. That is a reality. And, and you know, there's, we are, and, I, and I've gone through a little bit when I, when I started off of the detail with regard to why we are as a country at this point. And, and having taken office as a national director in 2019, and what we've tried to do then, and even going, going back, if one looks at Vusi Piccoli's uh, statement, which I mentioned, we are at this point moving forward, there's definitely a focus. But I think when you go backwards and look at why were these cases not dealt with, then it's unfair to put everything and ask the NPA to answer about why have these cases not been brought to book? 25 years since democracy. I agree. I have the same questions as the head of the NPA. But moving forward, this is what we are doing to address this because what happened in the past is completely unacceptable. 
And we know that there are a whole range of reasons. There were political reasons that these cases were not brought to court. They were not investigated. And, and you know, look at Vusi Piccoli's statement, it sets it up. So I think, and besides that, the important issue as well is even with as we move forward in terms of trying to deal with these matters, it's that we cannot, the NPA does not, and I, I cannot, I mean, I don't want to, I hope I'm not coming across as being defensive because that, that's not the case. The NPA does not investigate. We prosecute, but we work very, very closely with the DPCI investigative capacity in order to ensure that we have the investigators and working together with the families. I think there was another question about maybe Advocate uh, de Kock can give a little more uh, detail if necessary, but we are determined to work with the families and the representatives of families to deal with these cases. I personally have had meetings with them at the outset when I first took office in terms of ensuring that we have a very, very strong collaborative relationship. And we still commit to that because we know that they have important impact, important contribution to make to, to, to the NPA and the DPCI, because it's not just NPA to, to investigate these cases properly and to make sure that we bring these cases to book. Um, Chair, with regard to uh, the, the other issues, the media, just on that point, I just want to say that I have said this often before, you know, the media, in fact, the role of media in terms of um, is a, is a, the media is an incredibly important stakeholder for the NPA. And the role that the media plays in keeping the, the country and the people informed is incredibly important. And the role that the media has played in terms of the investigative journalism to save our country from capture is hugely appreciated. So we do not underestimate, and in fact, we appreciate the work of the media very, very much. All we are saying is that we appeal for responsible reporting, and that is the only appeal that we make. But apart from that, the media is hugely important, and we, we certainly respect their role. Uh, Chair, I'm going to ask my, my colleagues to deal with... Uh, Chair, is there, is, I, I believe there's a request for a short break. There seems to be a problem uh, with your system. Um, when I speak to you, you don't hear me. Oh, um, sorry at that about time, that. No problem. At, at that time, I, I, I was saying to you, um, there are many questions that have been asked. Maybe you might need to properly... Uh, I, I was saying to you, um, there are many questions. Mr. Sarela, please mute yourself. Yes, I was saying that there were many questions. Maybe you might need to to have uh, five minutes or so, uh, which will serve as a comfort break so that you can be able to spread your questions amongst your team members properly. Sure, that will be appreciated. Thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, can you come back at 12? We'll do that, Chair. Thank you very much.